Hello, and I'm so excited to share this episode with you. So if you are listening and you are in perimenopause, you're going through menopause or in postmenopause, then this episode is for you because I have a special guest with me who's going to take us through busting through some of the myths when it comes to menopause. We're going to talk about joint pain in terms of menopause and then also just finding some ways that you can navigate menopause, that you can make your body feel good and without necessarily restricting or following any sort of crazy diet. And so I am here with Dr. Jen Salib Huber, also known as the menopause nutritionist on Instagram, which is where I found her. And (laughs) Jen, if you want to go ahead and just take it away, give us a little bit of information about you and kind of how you stumbled here and then as the menopause nutritionist, and then we'll get right into it. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here because I love talking about all things menopause, obviously, but I really love giving a voice to some of the the lesser talked about things. And joint pain is one of those ones that isn't quite in the same spotlight as hot flashes and mood swings. And so it's great to be talking about that today. Um, So yeah, so I'm a dietitian, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I'm also in menopause myself. And so kind of part of my interest was the start of my journey, which started a little bit earlier than most in my late 30s. Um, And so kind of I've spent the last five to seven years kind of navigating that. And what I realized is that there wasn't a ton of information and support for people who were in perimenopause. Now, thankfully, that has really started to change in the last couple of years. Um, You know, I don't know whether it was the pandemic or it was just kind of good timing, but there really is a lot more, um, there are many more conversations happening around all aspects of perimenopause and menopause, and I'm just really grateful to be part of that. Yes, and she's joining us from the Netherlands, which I think is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So going kind of off of what you were, the introduction with kind of the joint pain associated with menopause. Cause I think, and some of the conversations that I've had with people, it's like, they had no idea that they could be related. And then, you know, people are always looking for answers to why they're in pain answers to, you know, why something doesn't feel right. And a lot of times I feel like menopause is left out of the conversation. It's immediately like, you know, let's do an x-ray, let's do all these tests. Let's obviously ruling out other things, but then they're just kind of left with, you know, I, you're just getting older, et cetera. And so I want to just kind of hear your experience. If you like personally dealt with any joint pain or just also some of the people that you see and chat with kind of what your experience is with joint pain and menopause. Yeah. And I think that you're right in that a lot of people have their experience dismissed because there is an association in time in that, you know, menopause is most likely to happen around age 52. And so just to kind of clarify, menopause is really just one day. It is the day that marks 12 months since your last period. Everything leading up to that is perimenopause and everything after that is postmenopause. So most of the time, these are things that are creeping up in perimenopause. So when women are still having a cycle, um, even if it's regular or irregular, They may not be having any of the other classical symptoms, but they're also more likely to be in their forties or their fifties. And, you know, that is a time when we start to just kind of, you know, assume rightly or wrongly that any joint pain, muscle pain injuries is related to aging. But we do know that as estrogen levels decline, that does increase the risk of inflammation or, you know, can increase the risk of arthralgia. And there isn't, you know, um, a really nice and clear cut explanation as to why. And even when they've looked at interventions like, you know, giving women, you know, hormone replacement therapy and measuring how much, you know, joint pain they have before and after it's kind of lackluster results. It's like, yeah, there seems to be a trend or some women really benefit, but my kind of my personal experience with the women that I work with is that hormone replacement therapy is great for many things, but I don't think anybody is, you know, writing books about how great it is for joint pain because it probably is complicated. It likely is a combination of things. Sure. Which makes it a lot harder. And that's even just going with osteoarthritis, whether you aren't postmenopausal or premenopausal, um, that just osteoarthritis in general can have a combination of different Um, attributes and it can have a combination of different causes. And a lot of times it's just blamed on age and it's just blamed on, you know, all of you're just getting older and those sorts of things, which then kind of elicit a fact of, oh, then there's really nothing that I can do about it. And 
So do you know, have you um, noticed at all, like with this joint pain and connection and being perimenopausal or even postmenopausal, does that tend to fluctuate a little bit more? Does it tend to respond to things differently than just like a regular osteoarthritis that, or someone that isn't going through this that you've noticed? Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing about perimenopause is that it's a moving target and it's like a roller coaster and hormones are fluctuating, especially estrogen, which is the one that we think is linked to joint pain. You know, estrogen is fluctuating a lot in those early perimenopausal years. And so you're going to have good days, bad days, good months, bad months. And that is also not, you know, dissimilar to kind of that, the experience of people who are living with osteoarthritis as well. I think one of the underestimated things though, is that especially when we're in post-menopause where we're kind of getting closer to that final last menstrual period and our estrogen levels are more consistently low, we really start to kind of get into that age and stage where building and maintaining muscle requires a little bit more intention and thought. And, you know, I always tell people that you can't, you're not, there's no downside to working on strengthening the muscles that support the joints, but you might have to actually maybe work with a trainer or work with a physiotherapist or work with someone who can help you kind of target that a little bit. And just to kind of give a bit of a personal take to this. So I tore the medial root of my meniscus about a year and a half ago and had that repaired recently. And, you know, I was really humbled by, you know, at 45 being non-weight bearing for six weeks, how long it took me to build up that muscle. Yes. And I, you know, I kept worrying that like the surgery was failing or that I was doing something wrong because I was still having so much pain. And my, you know, 22 year old physiotherapist was saying, you just have to wait to get the strength back. You're only at 40%. You're only at 60%. And it wasn't until I hit like 80% of what I was before that the pain dramatically improved. So I, we have to really remember how important it is to keep those muscles that are supporting our large joints. Um, you know, if joint pain is what you're experiencing, because it's not always joint pain. Sometimes it's just muscle pain and stiffness as well. Um, but yeah, we, ha- we can't underestimate the value of building in that strength. But also we can't, um, we shouldn't overestimate how quickly we can build muscle um, when we're postmenopausal, especially. Patience is virtue. <laughs> and that's one of the things that's like, you know, I've been doing these movements for the past couple of weeks and I don't feel necessarily super strong or I don't feel necessarily these huge results. And it's all kind of about those small wins that kind of drive things forward because it does take time. And as humans, we're just kind of set up in the society to not have patience and just to kind of expect everything to happen very quickly, which I wish it would was like that, but it does take work and it does take consistency, which I think is definitely important. And one of the last things kind of about <clears throat> in relation to joint pain is what are maybe some of the other symptoms of um, perimenopause that somebody may notice in combination with joint pain to say, oh, maybe this could be tied to something like that versus it's tied to an injury or it's tied, uh, I mean, obviously not having like a mechanism of injury, but what are some of the accompanying um, symptoms that they may notice? So we, we define the stages of perimenopause typically based on what's happening with your cycle if you're having a cycle. So some people have a hysterectomy, some people don't have regular cycles anyway, some people have IUDs um, that make it more difficult. But assuming that you know the average person is still having a period, if it's still really regular, and you're, but you're starting to notice changes in what we call the experience of menopause or experience of midlife and you're over 35. So maybe you're starting to notice that your sleep is changing. Maybe you're starting to notice that you're having night sweats or hot flashes the week before your cycle. Maybe PMS has gotten significantly worse or skin changes. There's kind of a set of nine symptoms that if you have three of those and you're over 35, there's a chance that you could be in the very early stages of perimenopause, but more typically perimenopause first comes on the radar when cycles become irregular, but not irregular enough that you're missing a period. So maybe your very classical 28 day cycle is now 
a 25 to 35 day cycle. And you're kind of never sure if it's going to be early or if it's going to be late. Or another really common one would be things like a really heavy period. So women will describe flooding, having, ha having experienced it myself, it really is a little shocking at, you know, how heavy your periods can become, even if they weren't particularly heavy before. Um, uh, you know, other people might experience things like headaches or migraines, or again, just that worsening PMS or mood changes. So, and because these are happening on a, not exactly a schedule, and they can vary from month to month when you're in perimenopause and still ovulating, it can be really hard for people, you know, whether that's, you know, the, the women themselves or whether it's their healthcare team to be able to kind of piece it all together. So I, you know, really think that tracking those kinds of things gives you information, but also gives you data to work with your healthcare team to say, Hey, this has been happening now for six of the last 12 months. Or I'm noticing these three or four things are happening together on a cycle every three to four weeks. That's really valuable because, you know, there are a lot of other things that can cause those symptoms. And it is important to talk to your healthcare provider so that, you know, you're, you're, you're getting good care, but it's also really helpful when we're working with people, if there's data for us to work with. Especially trends. I usually tell people, you know, yeah. People are always asked about like the past couple of days and things, but if you can notice trends, like even in blood pressure and things like that, those Absolutely. are going to be so much more beneficial as far as kind of pinpointing if you notice kind of what's been happening. And the same thing, even outside of menopause, it's um, tracking, you know, what movements are painful when you're noticing more pain, when you're noticing less pain. So then you can start to pinpoint, even yep. when you're going through this whole process, those painful movements and things are just complicating things. And so if we can kind of yeah. find ways to kind of dial those in, then it can make this experience a little more e or a little yeah. easier. Um, but cause I know that people are always looking for answers. And so if we yeah. can look at those trends and say, okay, this is what's happening. then it can definitely be a whole lot easier finding answers. Absolutely. And another aspect of the whole menopause experience is weight loss. And yeah. I'm sure that you talk about this all the time. Um, but I wanted to first go through kind of some of the, you talk a lot about myths and yeah. some of the main myths that are associated with menopause and then weight loss or perimenopause. Yeah. I mean, it, I feel like this could be like a six part podcast <laughs> series, but in short, weight loss has been, you know, oversimplified in that, you know, most people are, you know, taught to believe or kind of have, have been told that it's mainly about diet and exercise. When in fact, we actually have a fair bit of evidence through twin studies, for example, of like identical twins who are separated at birth, that genetics play a much larger role. And when we say that genetics play a larger role, we're not just talking about, you know, what your body looks like on the outside, but also the inside and how that probably translates. And I say probably because we don't exactly know is that, for example, the amount of calories and the, the you know, the breakdown of calories that your body wants and needs and will try to maintain is going to be different for each individual person. So if you're following a plan, that's just a, you know, a recipe for someone else's body and it doesn't suit yours, it's not going to feel good. It's not going to quote unquote work and it's not going to be sustainable. And I think that that's probably the biggest thing is that, you know, we have taught people to try and get to a certain body size or shape or number without really giving them the tools to say, you know what, try this on. How does this feel? Do you have more or less energy to do the things that you want to do? Do you enjoy this? We haven't given enough weight pun intended to pleasure and satisfaction and just, you know, kind of moderation that doesn't need to be counted and controlled because, you know, when it comes to food, the evidence that we need to be in a certain weight range for health or, you know, for health benefits at any age, isn't as strong as we used to think, you know, even like BMI, for example, um, you know, the, the quote unquote risk of being in, you know, the next BMI category outside of, you know, the recommended it's pretty, you know, it's pretty minor when you're looking at things, especially like, you know, more all cause mortality, which, you know, at longevity is actually decreased in people who are in higher BMI categories. So we need to move away from trying to pinpoint people to a number and expecting that number to be a proxy for their health. So that's the, the biggest problem, I think, with weight loss as a health 
recommendation is that it sets people up to expect that everything will get better if they can just lose weight. And in fact, it's more often the behaviors that are added that have a positive outcome or have positive, you know, effects on their health. And so that's what I focus on as somebody who has a weight neutral practice and practices and includes intuitive eating. I just don't, I just don't invite weight to the party, right? We're going to talk about everything else. I want to get you excited about food. I want to talk about adding more plants to your plate. I want to teach you to cook if you don't love to cook or help you figure out ways to include foods that you enjoy that you don't have to cook. I want you to have a healthy relationship with food. We're just not inviting the scale or the discussion around weight loss as a goal to the party. Yes. And I liked, I think it was in one of your posts, um, in one of the previous posts on Instagram about weight loss doesn't necessarily mean healthy either. And yeah. everyone's striving to, you know, lose weight. And even if they do lose 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds, doesn't necessarily mean that your health is also increasing either. And so I like the way yeah. that you um, approach that just because it's much more about kind of what makes you happy. And that's kind of where the whole keep the adventure alive came from is the same thing of getting people excited about movement and exercise and actually finding things that are achievable to do. And I know that you just briefly mentioned intuitive eating, and I wanted to kind of bring that to the table as well, just to kind of, so the listener can get kind of an idea of potentially what that is, um, as an approach to eating and aside from dieting. Yeah, I love it. So intuitive eating is a framework that was originally developed by two dietitians, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Reich. And they first wrote the book in the nineties. It's on its fourth edition now. And there's now over a hundred studies that support kind of the principles of intuitive eating as a way to help people have a relationship with food that supports their health. So it was, you know, kind of the original weight neutral framework, which in the nineties was definitely pretty progressive. And I didn't even hear about it. Um, you know, kind of until the mid, like 2014, 2015, but essentially it is 10 principles that are based on adopting a anti-diet mentality. So just kind of not pursuing intentional weight loss as a goal essentially is what it is. And instead of talking about food exclusively as, you know, a carb or a protein or how many calories or how much you can have, it's really about how do you experience hunger? And you know, what types of hunger do you experience? Is it more physical hunger or emotional hunger? How do you respond to taste hunger? Um, You know, it's teaching what fullness feels like, but I think the biggest shift that I see people benefit from is the shift in the mindset from a restriction mindset to a permission mindset, because intuitive eating is the permission to say yes or no, based on whether you want it, not because you should, or you think you need to, or someone has told you to, or you're allowed. It really just kind of takes that whole restrictive mindset out of the conversation. And, and it, and it includes joyful movement, you know, joyful movement um, is absolutely one of the principles. And so we we're focused on things that we can add in and joyful movement is one of the ones that a lot of people, I think, may be used to moving, but maybe not joyfully because they're using it as part of that calorie in calorie out equation. Sure. And I know that a lot of people are probably listening to this and saying, okay, well, I would love to eat, you know, bread. I would love to eat all of these things that have been demonized in some of the diet cultures. And what's kind of the conversation around, Are there any foods that you tell people to limit or are there, how do you kind of approach that? So we're not just, you know, opening the door, opening the floodgates to, you know, desserts and sugar and bread and all these things that people maybe have been previously told that they shouldn't have. Interestingly, we kind of have to do open the floodgates because it is the control that creates the cravings. So, you know, when people restrict anything, they increase their desire for that food. So people who are doing low carb or keto crave fruit. People who are doing low fat crave butter. People who are doing low carb (laughs) crave bread. Um, And the same is true with sugar is that, you know, sugar has been demonized as a food. It's been given, you know, addictive properties and, you know, superhuman qualities to draw us to the cupboard and eat all the cookies. When in fact, if we can really neutralize food so that all food has value, we don't try and, you know, say one food is better than the other, but if we're practicing attunement, we wouldn't feel good 
if we ate cookies for every meal exclusively, sure. right? Um, but we may actually enjoy our meal more if we're having cookies regularly. And if we can, you know, start by, I, I teach people to lead with satisfaction, ask yourself, what do I want? So that you're honoring that part of the equation first and then build in the gentle nutrition. If you want to have a cookie, great, but having, you know, a box of cookies, isn't going to be filling or satisfying, and it's not going to fuel you to do the things that you want to do. If you had no other choice, it would absolutely, you know, give you sustenance. It, you know, it, it would probably save your life in certain situations, but if we're looking to feel our best, well, maybe I'm going to have a sandwich with my cookie, or maybe I'm going to add in a salad with some protein or, or some cheese or maybe. So it's really about honoring what you want and then building in what you're trying to help your body, you know, kind of achieve. So, um, and that's why I call gentle nutrition is the sweet spot between what you want and what you need, but we don't have to micromanage it. And that's kind of the biggest thing that I like to help people on diet is this idea that everything has to be controlled, measured, tracked, accounted for, um, because that just creates craving. And then it creates, I feel like this negative, these negative emotions that, you know, if you did have a box of cookies or something, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. You know, or then you have this negative kind of this downward spiral of just kind of beating yourself up about it and trying to like exercise profusely or whatever it is to try to make up for it. And so I definitely think that this is a more welcoming approach to dieting because everyone is out there searching for the best thing. You know, what can I do to lose this X amount of weight? What specific details do I need to follow? And it's not particularly that easy, which does make the process a little bit more complicated. Um, but I mean, I just think that is a, more like psychologically too, that can play a big role. There are people that have been fighting carbs and fighting fats and fighting all sorts of different things and wasting a lot of energy doing that when we could be putting Absolutely. more energy towards you know something else and it doesn't have to be this like mentally draining process um one of the things i did also want to touch on is protein so what yeah. is your kind of approach on protein and how do you kind of broach that subject so, I mean, protein is one of the macronutrients that we need, right? So you can't go without it. Um, you know, it's difficult to get too much if you're eating food. I think that, you know, you can certainly get into some, you know, I don't want to say trouble, but you can get more than you need kind of um, if you're using supplements and things like that. But I think that protein is one of those foods that from a, a diet culture narrative has kind of risen to the top of the pyramid, right? So it's like protein is always good and we should always be trying to get more. And one of the things that I undiet is the belief that protein in and of itself is satisfying. And it's not, if you're hungry, you don't crave a chicken breast, you crave a chicken sandwich, right? You know, you want kind of that balance of it. So I describe, you know, building a balance plate as a three-legged stool. So if you're building a three-legged stool, you have a little bit of flexibility on where those legs are and it will still stand, but you can't have two legs in one area um, because otherwise it's not going to stand. So when you're building your balance plate and you've led with salads and you're, you've led with satisfaction, what can you add that will make it more filling and satisfying? And sure, protein is one of those things. And, but it doesn't have to be you know, at the exclusion of the bread or the potatoes or the rice. It really should be with it. Sure. Absolutely. And I think that especially kind of in this age range of the, you know, 40 to 60, 70, whatever it is that women don't necessarily get enough protein. Um, and so I think, especially with strength training and trying to, you know, build muscle to support the joints and things like that. I think it's definitely one of the things that's underrepresented in a lot of women that are aging, but I think that it's important that you can incorporate other things that you don't just have to strictly eat protein yep. or eggs that yep. you can include other things in that mixture. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on anti-inflammatory foods. Yep. Um, these very kind of specific food groups and these very specific even foods that have been highlighted as being anti-inflammatory. And what is kind of your approach on that? If somebody came to you and said they were trying to reduce inflammation or something like that, what would, and had joint pain, what would you kind of, um, how would you kind of approach that conversation? Yeah. I mean, the, the, 
It's a great question. And it's a conversation I do love to have because obviously I, I love all things related to food and nutrition, but the reality of it is that it's very difficult to study food-based interventions with very specific outcomes. So, you know, it's very difficult to say eating one thing or not eating one thing or a group of things is going to have, you know, a really slam dunk, you know, absolute, no question about it effect on something like joint pain. The good news though, is that there are some, um, there is some evidence or some studies looking at the types of foods that are included, for example, in the Mediterranean style of eating. So these would be foods that, you know, again, more plants on your plate, whole grains, fish, beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, foods that most people, you know, have heard of or have tried to include before. And I really like talking about this as, again, something that you can add in because there isn't a lot of evidence for restricting foods. So there isn't a lot of evidence that you need to avoid gluten, for example, if you don't have celiac disease, there isn't a lot of evidence that, you know, you need to avoid, um, you know, dairy white grains <laughs> or dairy. Dairy is another big one. Absolutely. There's even been studies that have actually shown that there's reduced risk of osteoarthritis and joint pain with dairy. So, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of evidence and I'm a big fan of, of questioning the status quo because all aspects of healthcare and medicine, you know, you can find examples of things that we've done just because it's the way we've always done it. And it doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean it's true. So I think that if someone feels really strongly about trying a dietary intervention, there's probably little harm as long as they're getting guidance and they're getting support and that they have a reasonable timeline to try it. So, you know, in my experience, if you, if you're doing something diligently for eight to 12 weeks and you're not noticing enough of a difference to want to keep doing it, chances are it's not a certain outcome. Um, you know, and so I think that that's kind of a good, a good way to approach any dietary intervention, really, if you're looking at something specific like joint pain, but certainly including more and adding more of the foods that are found in the Mediterranean style of eating, um, I think is a great way to go. And I think it's important too, because it's not necessarily, you know, eat this, don't eat that and more of the specifics of food, but it's just include more of the foods that you know, that are good for you, that you know, and a lot of times it's, you know, finding the convenience. And I think a lot of it is out of convenience of finding, you know, that's when you get into the protein bars and that's when you get into yep. the healthier, more processed type foods. Cause we know, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, a lot of us know what foods are good. And a lot of us know that we should eat more vegetables and things like that. And it's just the approach of just making your body feel good. Like odds are when you're eating more of those foods, you're likely going to feel better. And if we kind of use that as a guide, like for me, I don't particularly love vegetables, but I do eat them because it just makes you feel better. Um, and, and I think that, you know, having, getting out of what I call the, the all or nothing mentality is so key when it, when you're playing the long game in your relationship with food, because you don't want to be approaching any aspect of your health, but especially when it comes to food, which is something that you have to make decisions about multiple times a day, every day of your <laughs> life, often for other people, right. As something that has to be perfect. It doesn't, we can find examples all around the world where people are unfortunately living in less than ideal conditions, um, and still live, you know, quite a, you know, a long life and by comparison. So I think that we need to stop thinking that if we have a day that really goes off the rails or if we're on vacation and, you know, are having a lot of different foods that we're somehow doing damage because, you know, your relationship with food is about the long game and the better you can get at having access to foods that you enjoy, that you can have on a regular basis. And that also help your body to feel good and to help support your health. Awesome. Um, but certainly I don't lose any sleep over having a donut for breakfast on vacation. Yes. And the same is very synonymous with exercise as well. Yeah. You can find exercise that feels good. Even if you're doing, you know, something different or you don't do as much exercise one day if you're on vacation or something, it's this. It's just different exercise. exercise and it, you know, it still counts, but it's different and that's okay too. Exactly. And it's just kind of finding things that makes your body feel good. And if we can get kind of this food and exercise working together, I mean, you can feel 
so much better in terms of joint pain, osteoarthritis, stiffness, all of these things. Yeah. That are, and also are, menopausal symptoms. There's a fair amount of evidence that people who have a regular movement practice, um, and it doesn't have to be like wild and CrossFit, right. um, but just like people who have a regular movement practice of doing something that they enjoy a few times a week for at least half an hour report having a better experience through menopause. So I think that, you know, quality of life, not just muscles and how your body looks is such a huge internal motivator. Um, you know, I know for me kind of, I'm in the throes of it right now. And I notice really tangible things like changes in sleep and energy and mood. If my movement practice goes off the rails, right? So that's a really, um, you know, it, it makes me want to do it. I don't feel like I have to, I want to. Because you know that how you'll feel afterwards. Yeah. Yes. And so I think that this has been a great conversation of just kind of opening some doors to maybe different perspectives as far as approaching food, exercise, perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. Because I think as, I mean, with osteoarthritis too, there's not a lot of positive information when it comes to, you know, some of these life experiences or chronic conditions. And I think it's really, really important. And so if somebody wants to find out more information about you, where can they go? The best place is always going to be Instagram. That's where I probably hang out too much, but where I love connecting with people <laughs> um, at menopause.nutritionist and the link in my bio will, uh, will send you to all the right places. Okay, perfect. And then I will put the link down in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast and then down in the description, if you're watching on YouTube. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. I think that this was very helpful in bringing, shining a positive light on some of the things that get a lot of negativity um, and just giving people some things to think about. Kind of, like you said, challenging that status quo and kind of getting outside of the diet mindset and diet culture and kind of opening your eyes to say, okay, there are other ways that we can do this. And I just want to say thank you so much for spending this time with us and have a great yeah. rest of your day. Thank you so much. I've loved it.